You're live. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of SETI Live. And uh, my name is Seth Chostak. We have a very special guest today. And, you know, just about every show that has guests will tell you it's a special guest. They never say, you know, this is a rather ordinary guest. But today, I have to say, the guest really is special. And uh, he's been certified by the American Society of uh, Being Special as being special. It's Avi Loeb. And he's a professor of astronomy at Harvard. Uh, he has a list of credentials that, frankly, won't fit on a on a business card, even if you use both sides. We're going to talk to him about some of his ideas regarding what might be evidence for alien life. We will do that till maybe the bottom of the hour, at which point you can uh, just type in your questions, and uh, we'll we'll pass them on on to Abby. We'll we'll grill him like a shrimp on the barbie, as he is uh, wont to say. Let me also point you to the fact that the SETI Institute, which does these outreach activities, does so on the basis of donations. So keep that in mind. And also, you know, if you want to get our e-news, which tells you about these kinds of events, or you just want to learn more about the Institute, just go to SETI.org, O-R-G. Avi, welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay. Well, look, uh, you know, I know that you're someone who likes to stir the pot a bit on the subject of extraterrestrials. You have a book coming out. What's the title of the book? Extraterrestrial. All right. Well, that's uh, at least in keeping with the subject matter. Can, uh, can, let's, let's consider you know, maybe uh, the, the, the highest profile uh, analyses that you've made, and that is concerning o Oumuamua. Oumuamua. I think it's messenger from some faraway place in the Hawaiian, discovered with a... Pansar's telescope, I believe, in 2017. And you're suggesting that maybe this isn't, everybody jumps to this conclusion, it's an asteroid, it's a comet. That you're suggesting that maybe it's not. If somebody were sitting with you next to you, say, at uh, the counter at Legal Seafood and found out who you were, and, and they asked you, why do you think this is maybe not an asteroid or comet, what would you say to them? It's based on the evidence. Uh, you know, I, I follow this exactly the same line of reasoning that I apply to studies in cosmology or black holes that I worked on most of my scientific career. There was this object discovered and at first uh, from interstellar space. And at first, of course, astronomers assume that it's a comet because most of the objects in the solar system are in the Oort cloud and they can be easily ripped apart by a passing star. And so the first assumption about an interstellar object would be to argue that it must be an icy rock from the outer part of the planetary system from where it came, from another star. Uh, the only problem is that there was no cometary tail. And in fact, the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply be around this object and put very tight limits on any carbon-based molecules or dust around it. And Obviously, we couldn't see anything visually uh, from scattered sunlight, so it didn't look like a comet. So then the astronomer said, okay, it's not a comet, it's an asteroid. It's just a rock without any ice on it. Uh, the only problem with that is that um, it exhibited an extra push away from the sun that is usually associated with cometary evaporation through the rocket effect. And so the question arose as to what gives it this extra push. If you try to fit the uh, orbit of this uh, object, uh, this extra push uh, was with a force that declined inversely with distance squared from the sun. And by the way, so if it were a comet, I mean, the problem is that about 10% of the mass of the object had to get evaporated in order to give it this push. That's a substantial amount of mass. We couldn't have missed that in the form of dust or, or, or gas, the, us the usual constituents of uh, cometary tails. But moreover, at a certain distance from the sun, this push would stop. That's when uh, the water ice cannot sublimate anymore because there is not enough heat provided by sunlight at some distance and we would see a sudden change in the force that was not observed also we didn't see any jitter that you often see in comets from the fact that there are jets that are spread unevenly across its surface and we didn't see a change in the spin period that you often see in the if, if such a push push is is, is indeed the present 
Uh, and so the question was, what is this push due to? And of course, there was also the change in brightness as the object tumbled on the sky over eight hours. And that was a factor of 10, implying a very extreme geometry. The object projected on the sky was at least 10 times longer than it is wide. And the best fit uh, that was actually uh, done by Sergei Maschenko and published in December 2019, the best fit to the light curve of the object was that of a disc uh, flat surface, not cigar shaped, pancake shaped object uh, at the 91% confidence level. That is a fact that is often ignored. Uh, it's not cigar shaped, it's mostly most likely pancake shape. And well, well if I can jump in, Javi, uh, yeah. just going to back up a little bit for people who are uh, maybe not so astronomically inclined. What most people have seen of Oumuamu was this artist's rendition, where it indeed looks kind of like a bumpy cigar, right? It's 10 times longer than it is wide. But of course, the actual observations, the discovery observations of this object, you know, all you see is kind of a, a single pixel, right? So, you know, right. a, a lot of this is inferred on the basis of the change in the brightness of this thing as it's tumbling. Exactly. And uh, yeah. would that be enough? I mean, the, the, yeah. the strong so, argument you made, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, indeed, it's, a, it's a, a point source of light simply because the size is of order 100 meters or a few hundred feet, the size of a football field. And we cannot resolve it even with the biggest telescopes we have. Uh, and the only way to resolve it is to fly a spacecraft uh, um, close to that object so that you can take um, a photograph of it. So the only thing we can infer is from the reflected sunlight. And if you assume that uh, the reflectivity is uniform across the object, you can get a sense of its shape. Yeah, OK. So point one, I mean, uh, if I'm just going to list your arguments here, point one is that it doesn't really have the shape of a comet or an asteroid, those are more, you know, crudely speaking, they're round, you know, the shape of a chicken in physics, right? So they're <laughs> first order, they're round. This is all is elongated. We don't see too many asteroids or comets with that shape. Second thing, doesn't seem to have a tail. And without a tail, you know, it, it can't accelerate, you can't change its speed, you know, relative to just a falling rock. Third thing, it's coming from a different, now you haven't mentioned this, but it's coming from a different solar system. That that was the first point about it. It wasn't from our solar system. This is an intruder. It's like finding somebody in your house that you don't know. And, but what are the chances that a random rock kicked out of somebody's solar system would ever get into our solar system? That's like my throwing a you know a tennis ball up into the sky and hitting a nickel a mile away or a hundred feet away. Chances right. are small, right? You haven't said much about that. Is is that still a compelling argument? Yeah, um, well, there was one other uh, peculiar fact about Oumuamua, and that is that it came from sort of the local public parking lot. So there is the local standard of rest, which is the frame of reference that you get to when you average over the random motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. Each star has some uh, speed, but then you can average over the stars near the sun, and you end up in the local standard of rest. And Oumuamua was at rest in that frame. And only one in 500 stars is so much at rest. So it's very peculiar also on this count, because if it came from another star, it should share the speed of the parent star. Uh, and we, the relative speed between Oumuamua and us was just the motion of the sun. <laughs> relative to the local standard of rest. So the way to think of it is that Oumuamua was just like a buoy sitting at rest on the surface of the ocean and the solar system bumping into it like a giant ship. And if you look at the image of where Oumuamua was along its orbit, it started from the anti-apex. So exactly it came from the direction where the sun is moving to. And that's peculiar. And you put it, you know, each of these peculiar facts makes it 1%, uh, un, you know, unlikely, you know, very unlikely. And then the point is that some astronomers try to explain one of the peculiar facts. And uh, 
another, but they didn't put it together. And if you put all of these facts together, you end up with a very small likelihood that the first object we see will be so unlikely. Now, I should say that there were a few astronomers that took these facts seriously and tried to explain them. For example, the issue of a push without a cometary tail. So one suggestion was it's a hydrogen iceberg, frozen hydrogen, a big chunk the size of a football field that is frozen hydrogen. And the, the reason they conjecture that is because if you evaporate hydrogen, uh, you don't see the cometary tail because it's transparent. Hydrogen is transparent. The only problem with that is that it can be easily evaporated. So uh, we showed in a follow-up paper with Tim Huang that actually a hydrogen iceberg would not survive the journey uh, through millions of years. Another suggestion was that it's a collection of dust particles, a cloud of dust particles, just like a dust bunny that you find at home. But it needs to be very porous, about 100 times less dense than air, so that the reflection of sunlight will push it enough. Uh, and again, I find it hard to believe that such a thing would survive the journey through interstellar space. Now, all of the suggestions of people that took seriously the facts were of things that we have never seen before. And there was a big chunk of the mainstream community that simply said, it's natural, business as usual. And you find those people on Twitter, you know, ridiculing my discussion of an artificial origin, but they never attend to the details of the evidence that we collected. And this is scientific evidence. So my point is people that took the evidence seriously had to contemplate something that we have never seen before, like a hydrogen iceberg or a dust bunny. I'm saying if we entertain those possibilities, why not an artificial origin, a light sail being pushed by the reflection of sunlight. And my point is, I actually use it as an anchor. I'm not saying it must be that, but I'm saying that we should contemplate that possibility. And I'm using it as an anchor to basically demonstrate that we are not ready, that the scientific community is not ready to discuss technological signatures. And they have a big problem with this subject of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And I find that completely inappropriate. So I'm fighting the fight of SETI on this ground. And the reason I find it inappropriate is by now, there was a few months ago, there was a paper from the Kepler satellite arguing that about half of the sun-like stars in the Milky Way have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. So the Earth-Sun system is not rare. It's very common. There are billions of Earth-Sun systems within the Milky Way galaxy alone. What we find in our backyard is common. Now, if you arrange for similar circumstances, you might as well get similar outcomes. I don't regard the existence of technological civilizations as a speculation. It shouldn't be at the fringes of astronomy. It should be center stage because common sense tells you that the most conservative assumption to make in science is reproducibility, that if you have similar circumstances, you get similar outcomes. That should be the mainstream view. But instead, it's being pushed to the periphery, ridiculed. No funding is given to SETI to search for technological signatures. At the same time, young people that were engaged in research with me on this subject are you know, basically freezing. They, they see this reaction. They decide not to work on it because it risks their future job prospects. I find it completely inappropriate, given that the public is so interested in this question. And I've had 100 or more uh, interviews for podcasts, for TV, for radio, for newspapers over the past two weeks before my, my book uh, came out, and I have seen a similar number in the next uh, couple of weeks. The public is extremely interested in this subject, yet the scientific community ridicules anyone that talks about it. And this is inappropriate because the public funds science. How dare the astronomers ridicule this subject when they have the tools to address it scientifically? The oh. argument that I make, just one last point, um, you know, there is, of course, literature on science fiction that makes 
statements that are not scientifically credible. And there, there are reports on unidentified flying objects that are not scientifically credible. But just think about the dark ages when people were making claims that the human body should not be dissected or sh there should not be an op uh, any operation on the human body. And the argument was that there is a soul, there, there are some magical powers to the human body. Imagine the science community saying there are all these nonsensical remarks about the human body. We don't want to deal with the human body. Where would modern medicine be? The, 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 the key in doing science is if you have the tools to address a question, especially a question that the public is interested in, you have an obligation to do that in order to advance our knowledge. So how dare the scientific community? And by the way, I get a lot of uh, ridicule from people that are mediocre scientists. And they feel comfortable because it's just like bullying. And uh, you know, those mediocre scientists, the way I view them is just like this congressman that for many years made anti-gay remarks. And once he finished his term in March 2020, he confessed that he is gay. And so yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if many of these people that make anti seti remarks actually deep down are very intrigued by the possibility that Oumuamua was a technological relic. Okay, well, well let me follow up on that a little bit. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I, I feel your pain. I understand what you're saying. And I certainly feel that SETI deserves far more attention from the scientific community and obviously more funding. There's essentially no government funding for SETI in this country at all. So that, that, that is something that we have to remedy because you can't do, you can't do science without some, some degree of funding. But getting back to Muamua, I mean, there is this phenomenon that whenever we find something new in the skies, and after all, that's the job description of an astronomer, uh, you know, th there's a tendency that if you don't understand what it is at first, that somebody will suggest that maybe it is, in fact, of deliberate construction. It's, a, you know, it's an artifact of some sort. That was true for uh, Tabby Star, but it was also true for quasars when they were first found. You know, the, the Russians were saying that the, you know, this was a signal. It wasn't just natural emission. Obviously, it was also true for pulsars. It's been true for a lot of objects. The fast radio bursts, for example, there are people, and I think you, you may be one of them, who think that we ought to consider the possibility that maybe these are, in fact, due to intelligence elsewhere. So, you know, you won't get any argument from me. And in fact, you would get support from me that we have to look at these things, because if you don't, we will end up not finding ET simply because we toss all the evidence out right away. But, but let me just Beth, can, can I just say one thing? Of um, course. Um, you know, um, take the case of Giordano Bruno. I mean, that, that is an interesting historical case. He made the point that other stars may be just like the sun. It was centuries ago before people knew that. And he made the point that they may host a planet like the Earth around them. And then he said, that planet may have life on it. Now, the church burned him on the stake. The church found it offensive. Why? Because if there, are, there is life on other planets, that life may have sinned. And then you need Christ to save those lives. And you need multiple copies of Christ. And that was unacceptable. So they burned the guy. Now. Giordano Bruno was right that other stars might, you know, are, are like the sun. He was right that there are planets there. And, you know, maybe there is life there. But the reaction of some people to that possibility that we are not unique and special reminds me always of my daughters when they were infants. You know, they tended to think that they are unique and special and the world centers on them. But when they went to the kindergarten, they realized that other kids might have qualities better than they, theirs. And if they were to insist on staying at home just to maintain the sense of privilege that they had, then obviously they would have felt much more comfortable. It's the comfort zone of people to feel that they are unique and special and that we shouldn't search for anything else. And I think that arrogance, that sense of privilege is what drives this uh, 
backlash that SETI faces. And, you know, my start beginning uh, of the book, my starting, my, my initial statement is we should be uh, modest. You know, if you look at the sky, you realize we, uh, the message that you get is be humble, be modest, not arrogant. Don't think that you know the answer in advance. Look at the evidence. And I think, you know, that, that is a very fundamental message that is being missed in academia. One of the arguments that we discussed here, Avi, uh, that I found rather interesting in your first paper about Muamua was, again, this, this unlikelihood, if that word even exists, that, you know, something that was kicked out presumably randomly, if it's a naturally uh, produced object, kicked randomly out of somebody's solar system, who knows how many light years away, would actually come, essentially hit a bullseye in our solar system, came very close to the sun. I think it was less than an astronomical unit, whatever it was. And, and that suggests that it's being targeted. And you had mentioned that in your papers, but um, you know, so the, the conclusion is either it's being targeted or maybe there are gazillions of yes. these things. You need, you, throw... you need a, not a gazillion, but a quadrillion, 10 to the okay. 50. So no, if you I... assume it's a member of a population of objects on random trajectories, you need a quadrillion. Now, let me comment on that. If it were a rock uh, that you know is not thin, that's a huge amount of mass, a quadrillion. And in fact, I wrote the first paper with Ed Turner and Amaya Moore Martin in 2007, long before anyone was interested in interstellar objects. We wrote a paper forecasting how many such objects we should expect based on what we know about the solar system. And we predicted that pan stars will find nothing. It's only with uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory, LSST, that something will be found. Now, pan stars found something. And that is still in conflict with what you expect from rocks. However, if you make these objects thin, like a light sail, they don't carry as much mass. And it turns out if you just ask, you know, how much weight do you associate with a quadrillion uh, light sails of that size, it turns out to be roughly an asteroid that is a kilometer uh, in diameter. Okay, so it's not. I mean, it's a large amount, but perhaps there are self-replicating machines. Perhaps th these are surface layers of some other things. I don't know what they are. I, you know, the point of the matter is it's easier to supply the mass needed if these are thin uh, objects. Okay, so 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 maybe they're big, but I mean, because there is the fact that last year, well, 2019, in any case, uh, there was a discovery by a Russian amateur, right? Of yes, two I Borshop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Borshaw being the name of the energy. Uh, and this is clearly a comet, I believe. I think that right. there's a very obvious tale there. Yes. And it also came into our solar system. So That's right. uh, did, did, did that uh, challenge your co confidence at all? Well, I, I, I was asked, uh, you know, uh, is the fact that Borisov looks like a typical comet, does that uh, change your view about uh, Oumuamua not yeah. being natural? And I said, you know, when I met my wife on the first date, she looked special and unique to me. And I met a lot of women and people after that, and she still looks special to me. So whatever you say about Borisov has nothing to do with Oumuamua. I mean, the experience, the way I see it is walking on the beach and seeing mostly rocks and she seashells that are naturally produced most of the time. But every now and then you stumble across a plastic bottle that indicates that a civilization must be around. And this plastic bottle might be completely dysfunctional. You know, it might be debris, space junk. And my point is rather simple. We should search the sky for all the interstellar objects that enter. Many of them might be completely natural, but every now and then we will find some space junk. And that's one interesting way of doing SETI. Now, why is that a better way than radio looking, searching for radio signals? Is because for a radio signal, you need a transmitting uh, uh, civilization to be alive at the time of the transmission. Whereas with relics, they can be dead by now. It's sort of like the difference between speaking on the phone with someone, you need that someone to be alive, compared to getting a letter in the post, you know, in the mail. 
uh, because you can get the letter after the person is not alive anymore. And so physical objects have the benefit of accumulating over time. And even if most civilizations are dead by now and the ones that are alive are very small in number within the Milky Way galaxy, there would still be all this junk that they produced. Yeah, I, 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 it's somewhat like you know, trying to find the pharaohs of Egypt, because after all, I have a bone to pick with them, and you do too, actually. And, but on the other hand, they're not there, but you can find these pointy buildings to the west of Cairo that prove that they were there. So it exactly. doesn't require the synchronism. You exactly. know, we have a ton of questions. We really ought to get to some of them. Let me just uh, do a quick look, Avi, before we go, where people are listening from. And they're listening all over the place. I won't spend too much time on this. Kentucky. Uh, they're Kentucky. North Elmham. I miss El Elman? I'm not sure how they pronounce it. In England, Colorado, Florida, Sweden, Greece, Cape Town, Washington, D.C., Seattle, Sao Paulo. Well, there are many, many more. Let let's go to a couple of questions, if you don't mind, because uh, we don't have too much time. Um, yeah. Let's see. Oh, here's a question from Margaret. She mailed this in. Uh, could, Oumuamua, could Oumuamua be a component of a larger vessel that broke apart somehow? Maybe there was a crash and Oumuamua, you know, was chipped off uh, of a larger structure. Yeah, this is an excellent uh, question. And I was thinking about it because, you know, it may not be a light sail. It may be just a surface layer that was ripped apart. And the advantage of this scenario is you get a lot of such pieces from the disruption of a bigger object. And so, um, yeah, it's quite possible. We don't know. And of course, the way to know is to collect, to gather more data on future objects that look as weird as Oumuamua. In the case of Oumuamua, we saw it we detected it only when it was receding away from us, sort of like a guest we had for dinner that we noticed how interesting that guest is when uh, it lives, uh, he or she lives, uh, lives through the front door into the dark street. Uh, however, uh, if we find an object that uh, is on its approach towards us, then we can intercept it and take a close-up photo. And I think that is a strategy that should be adapted in the future. We can even distribute cameras in space and wait for those objects to pass by. Well, what, what about, I mean, the obvious thing that people will ask about a mua mua is, well, if you thought it was all that special, why didn't we, you know, fire off a rocket, go chase it, and make up close photos? Yes, it was moving faster than any of our rockets. And by the way, now is too late because it's already a million times fainter than it was close to the sun. Objects get dimmer inversely with distance to the fourth power, uh, simply because the amount of sunlight impinging on the surface of the object drops as uh, one over distance squared. And then you have another factor of one over distance squared because we are located at some distance from the source of light. And so uh, they get dim very fast and it will be impractical for us to send a mission that will chase it and find it because you need to equip that mission with a big telescope. So what our best hope is to find more of the same. And the Vera Rubin Observatory that is expected to start operations in about three years would have a much more sensitivity than pan stars and could find one such object every month. So the future is quite bright, actually, in finding such objects. And we just need to be a little patient. But will that result? I, I guess the, the, the question is, or I mean, this is an obvious question. What will future telescopes be able to do that we weren't able to do here? You've already sort of suggested that. But on the other hand, would they be very definitive? I mean, the chances that something will pass close enough that you'll actually get a photo with more than one pixel or something like that don't seem very great. Oh, no, it depends how early in its trajectory you find it. Just to give you an example, with respect to Oumuamua, I was visiting uh, Mount Haleakala in Maui, where the telescope is, in July 2017. Uh, and at that time, the object was on its way towards us. It wasn't even uh, entering the uh, Earth orbit around the sun. It was on its way in. Uh, and if we were to notice it back then, you know, we could have contemplated maybe a space mission or something that would go out to, to, to meet it along its path. Uh, we were not aware of its ex existence. We just found about it when it was moving away. So 
uh, if we, if we uh, for example, the Vera Rubin Observatory, you find it at a larger distance, farther out, so that it will take it, let's say, six months or a year to reach our vicinity, then we have enough time to launch something because we can forecast its path and we can go there. Um, we don't need to move very fast. We just need to wait for it. Uh, of course, we can also deploy cameras in strategic locations and wait for the next object that comes close. The other thing to keep in mind, we are looking at reflected sunlight. The bigger the object is, the easier it is for us to notice it at a greater distance. And there is a distribution of sizes that we should expect. And uh, the question is which size would be optimal for us to detect. There are many more objects of smaller size that are passing closer to any probe that you put. And uh, this is an optimization question as to how much money it costs to put these probes and so forth. Yeah, okay, I can understand. Now, one, one question that I, I feel I must ask is, you know, how, the, the nice thing about a Muamua for any theory is that, you know, you can't get more data, right? And whatever data there is, is what you got. The Muamua is gone, but playing devil's advocate here, suppose, okay, 2i uh, Borisov, that's clearly a comet. Right. And it was found three years after a Muamua. Right. Okay. Now, I don't know if that's a typical interval for, you know, how many of these things you're going to, going to find. I mean, that, that's too small. Well, that, a sample. That, that's a typical interval of time for pan stars, you know, because it looked at, at the sky for a few years and found a more, more. Okay. But with, with the Vera Rubin observatory, the estimate is if there is a population of objects on random trajectories that once per month, we would find such an object. And, you know, it also depends on the size of the object. We would find once per month, an object of about a hundred meters. Okay. Suppose that, uh, all right, let, let's take that. That means you get, you know, 10 of these things every year, uh, you know, a couple of years from now. And suppose we find, okay, here are these 10, and we have enough data now to show that, well, that was an asteroid, and that's a comet, and that's a comet, and that's an asteroid. So, and and it, if that's the case for the next 20 of these things. Would oh, that dissuade? Then, then, then I would argue, yeah, if, if, if some of these do look elongated as much as needed to explain the light curve of Oumuamua, then uh, I would accept the verdict, you know. Uh, the point about doing science is not about being right all the time. It's a learning experience. And we should, the important thing is not to put blinders. In other words, not to rule out possibilities before we have the evidence. And the, the mistake that uh, our colleagues are making is not even entertaining this possibility because they find it offensive for some reason. They, it bothers them to even discuss this possibility. My point is, let's collect more data. Now, if we say it's only rocks, then nobody cares about it. Who would care what shape the rock is? I mean, the only people that specialize in rocks. But if we say there is this possibility that one of these guys would be artificial, then you get to Oumuamua's wager, which is one of the chapters in my book where I talk about the fact you know, it's just like Pascal's wager where he said, okay, there are two possibilities. Either God exists or God doesn't exist. But if God exists, the implications are huge. Therefore, we should take that possibility seriously. So I make the analogy of, with that and talk about Oumuamua's wager, meaning that you should consider the implications and therefore we should be more alert. All these bloggers or people on Twitter that ridicule that possibility, they would ask you not to be alert. Let's forget about it. It's not interesting. It's in, improbable. It's never aliens. Therefore, let's keep our eyes shut and not even pay attention to these rocks coming from outer space. And my point is that these are self-fulfilling prophecies. If you tell yourself you will never find something unusual, you will never find it. Yeah, well, I, I, I certainly subscribe to that. I mean, uh, of course, I mean, it seems to be a bimodal distribution. Either you're one of the many people, it's about a third of the population, who thinks that the aliens are actually visiting Earth, in which case it's fairly trivial to, uh, you know, come up with some good data for that. I wish they would, but... Or you're on the other side where you say, look, you know, it's always going to be a natural explanation because we've seen that over and over and over with new discoveries in, in uh, astronomy. And uh, who could argue... Well, I hope nobody argues, except these people who are blocking about it. <laughs> I haven't read too many of them, but 
you but, know that Seth, Seth let me let me uh, respond to that because you know one of the puzzles in cosmology for example is what is the nature of the dark matter that's most of the matter in the universe right we are talking about 70% you know uh, or actually 80% of the matter in the universe made of something that we don't know i mean there is also the dark energy which is a separate component now First of all, why do us cosmologists get paid in the first place? They don't know what, what most of the matter that they are talking about is. But putting that aside, for decades, people invested hundreds of millions of dollars exploring various possibilities, like weakly interacting massive particles or axions. Okay? Now, uh, do we know that weakly interacting massive particles exist? No. In fact, we just, as a result of investing hundreds of millions of dollars, we just put limits. Actually, we ruled out all the original ideas about the cross-section and the mass of the particles that may provide the dark matter. And the same is true for any other types of dark matter. We still don't know what it is after decades, okay? And why would the scientific community regard this as a worthy exploration of a hypothesis, whereas the hypothesis that the technological civilization may be out there is considered speculative with no funds at all allocated to it. Why is that more risky? Why is a technological signature which just relies on the fact that you reproduce the conditions on Earth elsewhere and get a similar outcome? That to me sounds like much more robust. And well, it's a, it's a, is it not, Avi, is it not similar to what uh, Galileo faced, right? He was challenging the comfortable notion that we know the truth. And, uh, you know, nobody seemed to be interested. Right. But what I'm saying is in the current culture of science, there are concepts that are far more speculative, that are considered part endorsed by the mainstream, even though they have no merit based on the evidence we have. And take, for example, in the theoretical physics community, the notion of extra dimensions, string theory. You have hundreds of string theories working on something that not only cannot be tested based on existing experimental data, but it's very likely that during their entire career, it will never be tested. And they don't even feel the need to test it because yes. there are also philosophers that write books justifying their, their practice and saying that experiments are not really needed for you know, doing physics. Yeah. Now, to well, me, that sounds, wait a second, to me, that sounds as a betrayal of our obligations as physicists, you know, as in terms of describing reality. You have this culture of people that give each other awards about intellectual gymnastics with fancy mathematics that has no bearing on experimental data. And at the same time, SETI is being ridiculed. To me, that's, you know, an unhealthy environment somehow the culture in science academia is completely twisted in the opposite direction of where it should be. Yeah. SETI should be mainstream within the astronomy community. It should be mainstream, not just a little bit more funding. It should be exactly in the middle. And then all these notions about extra dimensions, string theory, that should be in the periphery. Let these people put some skin into the game, make predictions, and only if their predictions are verified, would we pay attention to the possibility that there are extra dimensions? Well, listen, okay, we're, we're essentially at the end of our time here. I, I, I do think there is a bit of a... And listen, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna argue against you in terms of the funding for SETI, obviously not. I, I, I agree with all of that. But there is a sort of an asymmetry here, right? If you posit that there's a particle that accounts for dark matter, if there's a little thing in that, you know, it's a wimp or whatever it is, right? You can at least spend some money, do an experiment, and the experiment is somewhat definitive. Your prediction was it's a wimp and it has this energy, so it should have this mass and whatever. Well, we have an experiment here. You just send a but, camera. But you, a yes, but you, what's the interstellar object, the next one we find, and you take a photograph. That's an okay. I, listen, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get my wallet, I'll get my credit card right now. I mean, I, I support that, but but there is this asymmetry that while you can't, you know, you can prove that the extraterrestrials exist if you, for example, do that experiment with the next object that comes in, into our solar system that looks interesting, or you do it with a radio telescope, or however you do it. 
it's, I think, fundamentally impossible to prove that they're not out there. And that's a little different than the physics problem, where you can prove that, well, doc on it, we didn't find anything that is in agreement with your prediction. Oh, you would be surprised, Seth. So people that propose the original weakly interacting dark matter particles, these particles are ruled out now, but then they shifted the parameter space into a regime that is not ruled out yet. So they're operating in an evasive way such that it's always alive, you know, the concept of weakly, even though the parameter space they're exploring now is completely different from the original one. And my point is, if you go and search for various signatures of other civilizations, of course, if you rule out some, you have others, but it's, it's no different from the search for dark matter. I don't see a qualitative difference. All right. All right. Well, I, I'm happy to hear that. Listen, Avi, it's been fantastically interesting. Obviously, this could go on for much longer, but uh, we have uh, obligations to the, uh, the, the people who are watching. I, I want to thank all these people. We had a lot of questions coming in. I hope that the discussion answered some of them at least. And if people want to read more, I know that you write for Scientific American, what, uh, rather regularly, right? Every couple yeah, of weeks? Every week or two. Every week or yeah. two. Okay. And so people can certainly find that. I commend those uh, essays to anyone. They're really worth uh, reading. And for the rest, uh, there's your book coming out. Is it out yet? It's out, yeah, as of a few days ago. And uh, uh, the response seems to be viral, I must tell you. It's really capturing the imagination of a, a very large number of people. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I hope you haven't developed an Amazon ranking fever, as so many people who <laughs> write books do. <laughs> but again, Avi Lo, thank you so very much for being with us. My Thanks to every one of you for tuning in. And I uh, uh, remind you that the SETI Institute has these sorts of sessions, SETI Lives. We also have SETI Talks. You can get all of this by just going to the SETI Institute website, SETI.org, and you'll find links to the things you need. You can get uh, signed up for our newsletter and uh, be, you know, it's sort of push technology. You can be warned in advance. You can have your rockets ready to go to make up close photos of whatever is going to transpire. Avi, thank you very much again. And bye-bye to 